Hi, everybody. It's Darren. Welcome back to another episode of, uh, I think we'll call this Coleman Wealth uh, Home Office Edition. Uh, and today joining me is Rich Day of Barclay Damon. Hi, Rich. Good morning. Good morning, Darren. Uh, Rich uh, is at Barclay Damon, which is one of the largest law firms in New York State outside of Manhattan. You have over 275 attorneys in 11 different offices. Uh, you and I got to know each other because you're the co-chair of the international practice area at your firm, and you help lead the U.S.-Canada cross-border team. So you work primarily with businesses and individuals that have uh, operations on both sides of the border. And I know from talking to you in the past that your specific expertise and experience is in dealing with M&A, corporate business law, uh, as it pertains to both individual privately held and publicly traded companies. And you represent a firm that has expertise in a very wide variety of areas. So I'm um, glad to have you on today and kind of begin to bridge into some of the knowledge that, that you bring and your firm brings. Thanks, Darren. I'll, I'll, I'll do the best I can. I'm sure it'll be all good. It'll be all good. Um, Welcome, listeners. One of the things that uh, I'm very curious about is because we have clients that have family and operations on both sides of the border, and you guys operate both in New York State, and you also come to Toronto and, and Canada quite often. And what I'm curious about is actually some of the common questions that you're getting from your clients, because I imagine our clients are actually having similar questions. So I thought we'd start by finding out what are your clients asking you and your team um, about this environment we're in now with this pandemic and the border being closed. And so, so I, I'll just kind of start there and see where this goes. Great question. Well, you know, as a result of the COVID-19, Darren, everybody's business has changed a lot. In the law profession, as will come no surprise to your listeners, the courts have effectively closed down. There's all kinds of extensions on anything dealing with litigation. So a number of practice areas in a firm our size are fairly quiet. On the other hand, uh, the phone's ringing off the hook on some others. Uh, we have people calling us on a very regular basis for advice on, can I get in and out of the country? So immigration has been busy. Uh, right. Yeah. Can I even get across the border if I have work or what? How do I do that? That's a, that would be a very common one now. Very common. I'll come back to that in a couple of minutes. Uh, another very common question we're getting um, is, how do I deal with my employees? What are my obligations to all of my employees in terms of safety? Um, <clears throat> providing them time off, uh, family health care law issues, a, a host of issues in the in the labor and employment area. And then uh, look at to be perfectly blunt about it, there are going to be winners and losers as a result of the crisis. Yeah. And on the on the more uh, sad side of that uh, balance, we have quite a number of people calling us who are struggling, whose businesses as a result of either federal or state mandate have been closed. And they're dealing with a lot of pressure, a lot of financial pressure, lots of issues with landlord and tenants, banking payment obligations, rent payment obligations, and the implications on a short-term and long-term basis. Um, on the other hand, as is always the case in any war, and as our president has, uh, I guess, appropriately described this as a war, there will be some winners too. And we have some clients who are unbelievably busy in the food industry, in the medical industry, no surprise there. Um, and so we're helping them grow. Uh, you know, we're helping them with new hires and dealing with panoply of new regulations. But there right. were, and from the Canadian perspective, uh, for your listeners who may be on that side of the balance, particularly those who view this as either a short-term or long-term opportunity to grow in the United States, there's a lot of planning that could be done and a lot of opportunities that will either immediately or ultimately become available to them. So this is good. So there's uh, there is obviously a dark side to what's happening. All of us know that. And then, but there is some light for this for some businesses. And I just as an aside, whoever's making these signs about how to stand six feet apart from everybody, I don't know who's running that business, but they're cleaning up right now. Um, I, I have ventured out of my home a little bit, and anywhere I go, there's like stickers and signs um, about stay so many feet apart. And uh, other businesses that do home delivery and um, they just can't seem to hire enough people. So there is positive growth there. Um, but I, let's just start, first of all, with the whole going across the border thing. Like right now, who actually can get across? If, you know, if you're in Canada, you need to get to the U.S., who's permitted and who isn't permitted? Well, so, uh, it would be an exaggeration for me to say that the border is essentially closed, but in some common colloquialism, the border is essentially closed until at least April 20th. 
Now, that being said, uh, this, this phrase essential business and essential travelers kind of permeates the whole spirit of all the regulatory oversight, I'm assuming in both Canada and the United States. If you're part of an essential business, the government wants you to continue. So essential persons are still entitled to, to cross the border. Um, we have a team of people in the firm who you know, specialize in this on helping people get across. If any of your listeners operate businesses and they want advice on whether they can get across and whether they qualify as an essential person, just give us a call. Uh, I'm also told yeah, by- Yeah, sorry, because proving that might be a documentation issue, right? Like how do you evidence that you're essential? You can't just say you are, they're, they're gonna require some proof of that that they're gonna have to provide. That's absolutely correct. You know, we're seeing that at the border and we're seeing it, we're seeing it elsewhere in terms of, again, this is very state by state, but in sure. New York, for example, where, where I live, uh, the mandate is to close down essentially uh, all businesses other than essential businesses. And we've been helping companies locally document that they are essential businesses because the authorities do come and question them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so apropos to your remark, and you're absolutely correct, if you claim to be an essential person, uh, give us a call. We will tell you what the U.S. Immigration Service will require in terms of documentation at the border to hopefully get you through. Uh, let me add that I am told that <clears throat> even though crossing the border on a day-to-day -day basis may be problematic, that the U.S. Immigration Service is still accepting and is processing applications like the TN applications and the L1. So these are, these are a visa applications that can be made by Canadian companies and Canadian business owners who want to obtain visas to come into the United States on a long on a, on a lo for long-term privileges, long-term usually meaning uh, a year, years, three years. And right. even, though, even though they may not, if their application is approved, they may not be able to enter the United States today <clears throat> if they're not part of an essential business. Looking forward, <clears throat> if they want to expand into the U.S. and they're thinking six months down the road and they want to apply for an L1 visa or a TN visa, we can still process those. We can help your clients process those. So. From that right, so immigration service is still open for business. Okay, yeah, so that, that process, if it's in place for someone or they want it, that can all begin. This, this temporary call of disruption, hopefully it's temporary, obviously, um, doesn't preclude people from keeping their feet moving and keeping moving positively towards what their intentions are. Correct. So that's good news. Um, let's move to uh, the stimulus packages because we're starting to see lots of money being spent. You know, in the US, you guys are already in the trillions. I think in Canada, we are already in the hundreds of dollars uh, that we're spending, uh, but it's, it's, we're in the billions, which is a big number for us, but for you guys, that's a Thursday. Uh, what, what are some of the things that, that people should be aware of? How can you support clients in understanding what is available to them, what's out there for them? Um, and along with the stimulus packages, just their own insurance policies. Many businesses have insurance for things around business interruption. Um, so maybe within the context of what resources have they maybe got in place as insurance that can help them, how do they navigate that? But then what about these government programs that are theoretically on their way to us? Well, I'll address the stimulus question first. Um, and most of that, I'm, I'm assuming without having read the 800 page statute, uh, I'm assuming it is intended to benefit U.S. businesses and U.S. residents. Yeah. Um, but whether, whether Canadians will benefit from that directly uh, I really don't know, unless they happen to have already established a U.S. Yeah. business entity, and then that entity may be, may be entitled to apply. Uh, that being said, um, as I recall, the, the SBA loan guaranteed immediate stimulus uh, to try to bail out cash flow needs, it's something like $350 billion. And applications for that, I believe, um, are either due or open up as early as today. Okay. And the explanation is that that money is going to go very quickly. So if any of your listeners happen to have existing U.S. businesses and they have an interest in trying to participate in the S in the Small Business Administration, the SBA program, they should reach out to their either either give me a call or reach out to their U.S. lenders because the banks okay. the banks are actually coordinating this. They will they will be the conduit to get that money. Um, 
you're probably familiar with the fact that the federal government is making uh, uh, distributions of cash to individuals yes. uh, below certain threshold amounts. Again, I think that primarily is a U.S. resident benefit. So I don't know how many of your listeners would benefit from that. Well, one thing I think that we're, we're going to encounter is many of our clients have operations or they're employed by companies on the other side of the country. So knowing that there's uh, stimulus packages in both countries and trying to figure out the patchwork of what can I get? How do I get it? You know, maybe my operations in the U.S. have a completely different factor than in Canada. So they're going to need some advice navigating this. And also, this is happening so quickly, trying to stay on top of, of the, the rules and who applies and who can get it and what for what amount and so on is remarkably complicated for anyone to navigate. And it, and it changes almost day by day. Uh, you know, two, two common questions that we get asked have, have to do with uh, making mortgage and loan payments. Mm -hmm. Other most probably common question that we're getting asked is rent payments. Yes. Uh, well, April 1st was yesterday and rent was due. So we'll see who paid and who gets to collect, right? That's exactly right. Now, uh, I guess in theory, in theory, the federal government could adopt statutes that impose moratoriums on mortgage payments and rent payments. Uh, to my knowledge, that is not part of any of the statutory framework that has been adopted to date. And so in the absence of some federal law, the mortgage payment and rent payment hierarchy, if you will, the matrix of that is a matter of state law. And every state's going to set their own rules. In New York State, there has not been any change to the rule. If you have a mortgage payment, make your mortgage payment. And if you have a rent payment, make your rent payement. Mm. Now, uh, I, now, that being said, in, New, in Erie County, where I live, they adopted a local rule that prohibits landlords from evicting residential tenants for 90 days. Okay. It doesn't waive the obligation to pay rent, but if you don't pay rent, they can't do anything for 90 days. It gives you an opportunity to make up the default. But this is going to be done at a very local level and at a state level. Uh, but if your listeners are renting office complexes yes. and facilities and they have concerns about that, happy to talk to them. Yeah, because you're right. There's so much of this stuff that's going to be at a local level, day by day, issue by issue, and they're going to need help understanding what are the obligations that they've got to other parties, and then what are the obligations that are owed to them. Um, one thing you've mentioned uh, before we started the call was that people do need to keep track of any losses that they're creating through this, um, that their businesses might be experiencing. I think that's important advice. Um, but let's move from the stimulus packages to the issue of insurance, because we've had in the press in Toronto anyway, in Ontario recently, uh, of a dentist who actually had pandemic insurance as part of his business continuity uh, preparedness. And the insurance company initially denied him his claim, but he's like, it's actually written right in there that I have a pandemic um, uh, coverage. And it led to just recently the head of the insurance company coming out and saying, actually, we will cover that. But it may have taken media and media pressure to have that happen because it seems like the default position of the insurance company was, no, no, we won't do that. But then it became an argument. So for people that may be looking to their insurance coverage right now, what would your advice be for those folks? Well, let's start with let's start being realistic and, and making the observation that insurance companies are in the business of making money and they want to limit how much money they pay to their insurance. Right. So as a general proposition, most insurance companies really don't want to pay you. And uh, it, just sort of in the interest of transparency, we have a lot of lawyers in our firm uh, who spend a lot of time reading insurance policies and trying to find a way to help an insurance company not pay a claim. Mm -hmm. part, of what, part of what we do. Uh, because insurance policies are really nothing more than contracts. It's right. a contract between the insured and the insurer. And of course, what you hear about on television uh, in all the commercials is all the puffery about when they're going to pay claims. But when it gets down to the nitty gritty- well, we, got, we got you in our hands kind of thing, right? All those metaphors. When it gets down to the nitty gritty and whether it's a pandemic like we have now or a hurricane or a tornado or a flood, then it gets down to the, the, the fine print and whether your particular policy does or does not afford you coverage. Right. So uh, 
there are there are business interruption policies. A lot of business people buy them. Whether or not they will have a valid claim or not is going to depend upon the words on the paper in their policy. And with all of the different companies, insurance companies that exist out there, and all the variations of the policies that any individual company has generated over time, there's going to be a myriad of policies and a myriad of, of provisions within those policies. So here would be my advice. Number one, absolutely keep track of all your losses, <clears throat> uh, not only for a potential insurance claim purpose, but also ultimately for tax purposes, even if your insurance doesn't ultimately succeed. With respect to insurance, <clears throat> work with your agent, make a claim. <clears throat> if the insurance in company honors the claim, that's great. If they don't honor the claim, it doesn't necessarily mean that you should give up. If there's enough money involved, um, and I don't mean this to be self-serving, but if there's enough money involved, contact your attorney. Let him or her read the policy and determine whether they, whether he or she thinks there is or is not a good claim. You know, if you have if you have policies that have disclaimers that are based upon disease, um, what does that mean? If you have a disclaimer yeah. that is based upon acts of God, what does that mean? Um, now that's much different than if you have a disclaimer that specifically talks about a pandemic. Right. And so it's all a function of what the contract says. I'm I'm a contract lawyer. And um, I spend a lot of time working with my clients, and I frequently have this conversation with them, which ultimately boils down to what does the contract say? And so that would be my advice. Keep, your, keep track of your losses. Make your claim. If it's honored, that's great. If it's not honored, don't give up. You know, Have an independent third party, such as an attorney, look your policy over and let him or her give you advice on whether or not you should take it to the next step. Well, and actually, that leads to another point I wanted to make, which is around getting the right expertise to help you with your problem. You know, one of the things that we spend time doing is building relationships with folks like you and companies like yours, firms like yours, that have a tremendous skill set because we want to get specialists. Like we found in the cross-border world that we operate in a lot is you've got to know who the specialists are because they're the ones that can solve the problems fastest and best. You know, we I usually make the joke that um, if you want to pay a lot of money, hire an amateur. Uh, you know, you've got to get the right people. And so when we deal with a situation like we have now where, you know, we've got what is my insurance coverage? Uh, what is my ability for me or my staff to cross the border to keep my operations going? How do I deal with, and I don't know if we're going to have time today, but the whole issue around what are the rights of my employees to work or not to work? And if I lay them off, like that's a whole other conversation that maybe we'll arrange um, and what about when I look through this and I want to grow my business again, because one thing we know about all the stimulus money is that it always arrives a little later than it could just because the operation to do it. But when it comes, it's going to be a wave of capital to try and get the global economy restarted again. So business owners that can make it through this and kind of look across the valley will have tremendous resources and hopefully went at their back to grow their businesses. So how do they have a partner for that? So. So one thing we look for are making sure that our clients have access to people in firms like yours that can access whatever that specialty is, because it's very hard for one individual lawyer to do all of this stuff, right? You know, the lawyer that may have helped with a real estate transaction probably doesn't know how to read effectively or with your skill level what's in the insurance contract as an illustration. And well, you have a huge range of people there, right? No, that's absolutely correct. And honestly, I don't want this to sound like a commercial, but that's that's that is the benefit of dealing with a large firm. And um, our firm, uh, several years ago, we created what you referred to in your introduction as being our cross-border team. Mm -hmm. And the cross-border team is a group of partners in our firm who work together. We actually meet once a week. We've been doing it for years. And we, uh, the the cross-border team members include uh, some folks like me who do corporate and and uh, mergers and acquisitions work labor and employment lawyers, immigration lawyers, tax lawyers, intellectual property lawyers, uh, et cetera. And uh, so we try to promote ourselves as being sort of the one-stop shop right. for Can Canadian businesses who have an interest in expanding because we know how to help in, in the broad sense. We, we communicate with one another and uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with using your, your local attorney on some matters. 
when it starts talking about expanding into the U.S. and you have this panoply of issues that you need to address at the outset, my recommendation would be that you go to a larger organization. Yeah, we would echo that because the web of complexity uh, is 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 huge anyway. But then we compound it with things like this, where all the rules are changing and changing very quickly. Having those resources on your side is invaluable to me. Absolutely correct. Yep. So so let's just pivot now to um, what we think might happen coming through this. So. Uh, like hopefully, because you, you've worked with companies that are in Canada, want to expand in the United States. Um, are you hopeful that they will continue that process when we're done with this? I mean, we've got our fingers crossed that all this stuff is over. Obviously, it won't be by Easter as uh, even Trump's backed off of that hope. Um, but hopefully by, by summertime, we can start getting lives back to normal. Um, are you hopeful that you'll see an increase of people wanting to grow and expand and get things back again? Are you hopeful for that? Well, sure I am. Sure. I tend to be optimistic in this, and I'm a believer in history, that history repeats itself. And there's no doubt that over time, we will all recover from this. The yeah. economy of our respective countries will recover. And as I said a few minutes ago, there's gonna, there are going to be winners. There will be, there will be winners. Those companies who position themselves to take advantage of the U.S. marketplace, what I expect will be an enormous amount of pent-up demand for certain kinds of goods and services, mm -hmm will be sitting in a good position. And I, I can tell you as recently as yesterday, literally yesterday, I was on the phone with a Canadian company who is in the software business, medical software. They are hiring people. They talked to me about expanding into the United States and two states where they want to open up offices. Um, so we're working with them. So there, there are some Canadian companies that are positioned to, I think, immediately benefit. And there are others if they have a long-term vision Mm -hmm. uh, where they think that the opportunity will present itself three months from now or six months from now, I would encourage them to at least start the planning process. And uh, you, can, you can take care of your current immigration needs. Um, you can form your U.S. company so that it's ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, you can start the process of protecting your trademarks and other intellectual property so that when you're ready to make this expansion into the U.S., you are primed and you're ready to do that. That's very good advice. Along very, the, very good. If you don't mind, I'll just, I'll just continue for another minute or two on this Please. theme. Um, a lot of Canadians that, that I've spoken with over the years are not aware of the fact that in the United States, we do not have federal corporations like you do in Canada. Right. So, so in the United States, if you contemplate forming a company here, it has to be done at the state level. And we have 50 states, you have 50 theoretical choices. Right. Um, probably nine times out of 10, when I talk to a Canadian business person who wants to expand into the states, they ask me to form for them a Delaware corporation. I was gonna say, that's the most popular one for some reason. The most popular one. And, and, and it's popular because Delaware does not have a state level corporate tax. State right. level tax. Any corporation in any of the 50 states still gonna have to pay federal corporate income tax. But Delaware is one of several states that does not have a state level tax. Delaware, Nevada, Wyoming, I think are the top three. Um, so you say, so I should immediately go and form my company in one of those three. Seems obvious. Right, the answer, but the answer really is maybe. And why do I say that? And I'll, I'll make a very simple example. <laughs> a Canadian client, decides that they're going to enter into the U.S. market, and they say, Rich, I want to form a corporation there. Let's form a Delaware corporation. But, geez, Buffalo is right across the Peace Bridge. I'm going to open up the office and distribution center in Buffalo. Fine, except that that company is now doing business in the state of New York. It has a physical presence in the state of New York, and it will have to pay New York State corporate income taxes. Okay. Okay, so... Having formed the corporation in Delaware did not necessarily achieve the result that the Canadian business owner thought they were going to get. Uh, whether or not, therefore, it makes sense to not form in Delaware and instead form in New York is a function of many issues, including how many different states the business might be generating revenue from, how much they intend to expand in the future whether they're going to expand and have physical offices in other states or not. 
my point being it becomes an analysis and right. whether or not you you form in one of these tax-free states or not is not quite that simple a question uh, so you know you need to work with your attorney need to work with your tax advisors run run the calculations and then you decide well as my friend from newfoundland says it's tangly it's tangly <laughs> it's always tangly uh, it's always tangy. Well, that's the good news, right? Is I think you're right. We need to deal with today and getting through and follow all the protocols and, and stay six feet apart. Although in Canada, that's one hockey stick. That's one poke check. That's the Canadian measurement. I'll share that with you. You're, you're close enough to Canada to know that measurement. Uh, and we've been hockey games together, so we both know what hockey sticks look like. Um, and so we got to get through this stuff, but I think you're right. If we can stay positive and look forward to getting to the end of this and everybody back to work and take advantage of the situation as we can. I think we have to stay positive and you're right. It, right now is the best time to also deal with the now, but plan for the future. And I think the businesses and the individuals that are thrive are the ones that keep their feet moving and they keep planning and keep looking at what's the good stuff that is gonna be coming. Let me just make one other random comment, Darren, just before I forget to make mm -hmm. it. Uh, some Canadians, uh, if they do decide to create a business in the United States, they need to give serious consideration to whether or not they want to own it directly mm. yes. or another Canadian company. And my observation would be, think about that very carefully, because if you take direct ownership of a U.S. corporation as an individual Canadian owner, you are now going to make yourself subject to the United States estate tax. Yes. Right? So our recommendation almost all the time is that the U.S. company be owned by a Canadian entity, right? A corporation, sometimes a trust, that is ultimately owned by your by your Canadian. In a similar vein, in a similar vein, and they're going to want to jump on this. And given the crisis, we may well see a drop in real estate prices, especially mm -hmm. places like Florida. And there may be an interest in buying vacation homes down there. Oh. Well, like we saw in 2011, when our dollar surged past the U.S. dollar and the U.S. market, uh, the housing market in Florida after 2008, 2009 was very, very low. We saw many Canadians buy a home uh, in Arizona, Florida, anywhere it's warm. Uh, they were shopping. Exactly. And my same my same comment would be uh, with respect to buying U.S. vacation property. Uh, be careful about purchasing it in your own name. Mm -hmm. Our strong suggestion is that it be purchased in either a U.S. or a Canadian trust. Right. Uh, only for U.S. estate tax purposes, but I'll make this one other comment. And you're, this is the typical example. Somebody from Canada decides they want to buy a property in Sarasota or mm -hmm. Naples, Florida, and they buy a condo there. Yes. And then, <clears throat> when they die, that property gets hung up in the Florida probate court proceeding. Because, right. because until it clears the Florida probate court process, the family of the deceased Canadian owner cannot do anything with that property. You can't, right. sell. it's just stuck. And in Florida, uh, the probate process is a slow and lengthy one, also happens to be rather expensive. Um, so there's just a number of disadvantages of jumping in and buying vacation homes in your individual name, you really should be consulting with your attorney as to how to best structure that. Oh, I agree. And we see the, uh, the when people come to us and we got to figure out what, and I call it forensic financial planning is what went wrong. And a very common thing we see is that Canadians will go down and do a transaction, they'll buy a business, they'll buy a property, and they'll get local advice, tax and legal advice from whoever's in that market. You know, we've had situations of clients buying something in Naples. You mentioned, you know, they're sitting at the pool with the family from Minnesota that they see every year and they get talking and they say, oh, you should have really put this. It can't be in your name. You should put it in a corporation. Da, da, da. And then they wind up following advice that might be very good for an American tax father, for an American citizen, an American resident. But it winds up being enormously problematic for the Canadian because the rules are different. And it's very what we found is it's extremely important that anybody who has that cross-border reality, they must have advice from advisors that understand the complexity that the border creates. The local guy might be great for the local client, but as soon as you have the border into it, we've got to find folks like you 
that really know how does this play depending on where you happen to be. It's extremely important to get that. Otherwise, it creates a mess that uh, most people have no idea how problematic it gets and how expensive and slow it is to fix. Completely agree. Completely agree. And uh, just one other comment, Darren, before we close, because I know we're running out of time. Um, our firm has been extraordinarily active in the last several weeks in sending out, we just call them alerts, but they're basically emails. They're informational emails on a variety of topics that uh, that relate that, that relate to the virus and, and the crisis, the international crisis. If any of your listeners have any interest in just getting on the mailing list because they would like to monitor uh, statutory and regulatory changes in the United States, <clears throat> just have them reach out to me. I'm just happy to put them on the mailing list. They can stay on sure. as long as they used to, but I think it would be a great educational way for them to keep on top of these ever-changing developments that's going on in the United States. So my personal email address is rday, R-D-A-Y, at barkleydamon.com, and I'll spell that out, B-A-R-C-L-A-Y, D-A-M-O-N.com, rday at barkleydamon.com. If any of your listeners would just like to get on the informational stream, just send me an email. I'll be happy to put you on the list. Oh, that's great. Thank you for doing that. I'll actually put your email in the in the descriptions for the video so that people just click on and get right to it. And I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I get those in my email box and I and that you guys have been so active at taking all this information and packaging out the key things that I need to know and be on top of for our clients. So thank you very much for doing that. And absolutely, if anybody is interested in this stuff, I think that's a resource that they should jump on. And thank you for making it available. My pleasure. So, Rich, I'm going to close it there. I know you've got things to do. It's, we're all, it's amazing how busy we are, and we're all in our jammies almost, but we're all working way hard, uh, much harder than we probably should. Um, and I finished watching Tiger King, so I'm done with Netflix for a while. Tiger King was enjoyable. Uh, we're running through our list, all that list of Netflix shows that we've made that we decided, you know, we're going we're gonna to go down them one at a time. That's good. And actually, I've discovered that I had these things in my office uh, in my home called books. I don't know if you're familiar with these, but I have these. They're all over the place and they have these things in them called words. And well, mine has charts because I think I grabbed a textbook that I, I like. Anyway, so uh, so I'm trying to get the reading done and uh, I do have to take my dog for a walk shortly. So I'm going to shoot another video because uh, my walking with Charlie videos have been um, surprisingly popular. I'm surprised people want to watch that, but I'm glad they're finding it entertaining. And I'm glad that this also gives me a chance to introduce you to some of our clients and our friends, because uh, I think at the end of the day, we all need help, uh, all of us. And if we can get the right resources at the right time for the right people, we're all going to be through this OK. So, Rich, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. And I can't wait to see you in person uh, when all this is over. And uh, we'll play a round of golf together and uh, you will laugh your head off when you see me play. So it'll all be good. Darren, thanks for the opportunity and the invitation. Stay safe. I, I, to all your listeners, stay safe. And if we can give any help, by all means, just let me know. Thanks, Darren. Right. Thanks, Rich. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.